Uh, so we are going to camp out on the first, these verses 3 through 10 for the next couple of weeks uh, because it's so, it's so thick, it's so rich uh, theologically. And, and I was thinking about what, what Paul is doing in these verses. And actually verses 3 through, th- through 6 that we're going to look at this morning uh, is one long sentence. This is sort of where Paul gets his reputation as, as a guy who writes really long sentences with commas and, and, and semicolons and just all of these different phrases bung together. We don't really do that in English, and so it's in your Bible, it's probably split into two or three sentences, uh, like mine is. Uh, but Paul has this, this, through verses 3 through 10, 3 through actually 14, no, 3 through 10. Sorry, 3 through 14, is this hymn of praise that Paul writes about what God has done in our salvation. And we get, this week we're going to look at what the Father does. Next week we're going to look at what Jesus does. And this week, sorry, the third week we're going to look at the work of the Spirit in the last two verses as well. Uh, And so this week we're looking at verses 3 to 6 at the work of the Father in salvation. And I've called these, this sort of mini series, To the Praise of His Glory. You notice we sung a song about to the praise of His glory earlier, to the praise of His mercy and grace. And that those verses actually were, that first song, were taken almost word for word from Ephesians chapter 1 here. Um, but what Paul is doing in a sense is he's, he, he's, he's using really elevated language. He's describing this um, incredible thing that God has done. And in a sense, what I'm hoping for this morning is that you'll catch a glimpse of that and that you'll come away in a spirit of worship, that, we want, that this drives us to worship our God. Because Paul writes this to the praise of His glory, in order that we would worship. Just thinking about it a couple seconds ago, I've just, have you ever, what's the most amazing sight you've ever seen? I can remember personally standing at the Grand Canyon, and just, it's so, I mean, pictures can never do it justice. It's so Huge, uh, just it's mind boggling, and you just stand there and you're outside of time, outside of space for a second, and you're just marveling at the wonder of this thing that is. And in a sense, that's what Paul is doing. He's standing in wonder at the work that God has done in Christ for us, and, and he wants us to gaze in wonder at what our Father in heaven has done. And so he begins, and there's three things that he, that he says that uh, the Father does. There's three verbs in there. God has blessed us. That's in verse 3. In verse 4, he chose us. And in verse, five, in verse 5 and 6, he predestined or preordained us. And, and so the, the, the big picture this morning is this idea that in Christ, the Father has blessed has chosen and has preordained all of those who He has given to, to, to Jesus. In Christ, the Father does these things. And so the first thing is, in Christ, He has blessed us, in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. The first thing that we kind of get a picture of is, is who God is. The, who is this bestower of this marvelous blessing? He's not just God, but He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who blesses us is our Father. Now, all of us have fathers. Some of us might have fathers that we don't know, that we've never met, but we all have a father. Biologically, we all have fathers. But sometimes when we talk about God as a father, that's difficult for some of us who have fathers who are less than, earthly fathers who are less than perfect. Some of us have fathers who are pretty terrible. We could be honest. We can speak frankly about that. And so when it describes God as a father, <clears throat> he's not a father who's indifferent, who's passive, who's abusive or confrontational. It's not one who manipulates us, who is temperamental and fickle. No, he's personal. He's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we know God personally through Jesus. That's the incredible revelation of the New Testament, that we can know God personally through Jesus. He's a good, a loving Father which is why we prayed, as we did earlier, as Jesus taught His disciples to pray, 
our Father who is in heaven. Our Father who is in heaven. And we know He's good and loving. James chapter 1 and verse 17 says that God is in heaven and every good and perfect gift comes down from Him. He is the Father of lights. And what that means, James says, is that He doesn't change. There's no change or variation with Him as with a shadow. No, He is the Father of lights. He is perfect light. There's no change. Steady, illuminating, good, perfect. The bestower of the blessing is God the Father revealed in Jesus. Look at me just a second for this first thing. And so this God, this, the, our Father in heaven, He blesses us. And he, Paul has this magnificent, magnificent statement that He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What's the extent of that blessing? He says He's given us every blessing. Every blessing. Paul says later in verse 8 that he has lavished upon us the riches of his grace. It's the picture of God, our Father, who's not only is he good and perfect and loving and we know him personally, but he has every resource at his disposal. There is nothing that he cannot give. Every blessing. In fact, the blessing is so incredible It's so rich. It's such a wealth of blessing that later on in in verses uh, 17 and 18, Paul prays that we would be able to grasp it. He says this, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. So he prays that we would have a spirit of wisdom and knowledge and that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened so that what? So that we can know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance. It's such an immense blessing that Paul actually prays that the, that the saints in Ephesus would have the spirit of wisdom, that have everything they need so that they could actually just grasp what that blessing is. It's so immense that it's mind-boggling. The Father gives us every spiritual blessing. And where is that blessing located it's located in the heavenly realms in the heavenly places it's a phrase that Paul uses three or four times throughout the book of Ephesians and if if we look and do a quick word a quick phrase uh, search on this this phrase uh, it's the place in 1 verse 20 where Jesus reigns supreme Paul says, in the heavenly places. It's the place where spiritually we are seated and reign with Christ in chapter 2 and verse 6. It's also the place where the wisdom of God, revealed in Jesus, is made manifest through His church to the rulers and authorities in 3 verse 10. The rulers and authorities, I suspect those are spiritual because in chapter 6 and verse 12, the verses which you might know well, The heavenly realms are also the places where the rulers and authorities and cosmic powers of this present darkness and the spiritual forces of evil are also active. This is the spiritual realm. God has given us every blessing in the spiritual realm. And because Jesus is seated in power and we reign with Him, they are all of them at our disposal in that sense. He's made them all available to us. But there's a qualification. In order to receive that blessing, we must be in Christ. That's the qualification. He has blessed us in Christ. My brother Best quoted the verse earlier, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. God has transferred us from the dominion, the domain of darkness to the kingdom of His blessed Son. And so we are in Christ. How did we get there? God transferred us there. Not based on anything we did, but based on everything that Christ did. What does that mean? Can I suggest two things for you? The first is this, that if God is our Father... We can and we ought to talk to Him. We did talk to Him earlier. I was thinking about talking to God this week. 
And I, my daughter, is my youngest, is just starting to talk. She's the one babbling back in the corner. But before she, she's got quite a, she's got probably 20, 30 words of vocabulary. She just started in on colors. But before she really started talking, she got mama and papa down really well. And it's amazing how much a child can com communicate with just papa, eh, or papa, eh, or papa, ha, ha. It, it's, it, they're incredibly communicative with just one word. And we get to call on God, not just as our king, not just as the one who reigns, not just as Lord, but as father, as daddy, as Abba is, is, is the word that, that Paul uses in Romans. Call on him as daddy, papa. Sometimes it's hard to pray. Sometimes you think, I'm in a situation, I don't know what to say. Can I suggest that all you, in a sense, all you need to say is, Papa, Daddy, Lord Jesus, help. No more words are needed in that sense. The Holy Spirit has a role in that as well. We'll talk about that in two weeks' time. But can I encourage you, if, if you're not the praying type, we actually all can be the praying type because talking to God is really easily. And I suspect like a child, as you start, you get more vocabulary along the way. I used to do a lot of youth work. We don't have a youth group yet. I'm hoping, I'm praying for some youth to have a, a youth ministry at some point. But I was just to say to the young people, when we sang, one of the reasons we sing is to give you vocabulary so that you know how to talk to God. I was, I was amazed last night. My wife was praying with our children. And my daughter started praying this amazing prayer of worship. And it sounded really, I mean, she didn't stutter. And it turned out that she was using the words of one of the songs that my wife sings to her in Jesus. You're so, I think we sing it in English as well. You're so big, I can't get over you. It's so wide, I can't get around you. And she was praying those words. And it was like, yes, that's, yes. <laughs> you've, got, you've understood something about the love of God. And now you're putting it into practice. He's our Father. We can talk to him. The second thing I want to suggest to you is this idea that the most important things are spiritual, are not material. God has given us every blessing, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. And I want to suggest to you that the application of that for us practically is that we need to prioritize the spiritual over the material. Now, we could take that the wrong way. I want to explain what I mean by that. We have a lot of self-help stuff in our world. How to, how, to, how to get your house in order, how to be more organized, how to do... I mean, you could find a self-help thing to do anything you want to do. We can, we can talk. We can learn to, to talk about our feelings. We have all of these things that we can input into our lives to help make life better. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, those things have a limit to them. The next crisis arises. The next thing goes wrong. And you have to start all over again. And actually, the thing that carries on being helpful, in a sense, is Jesus, is the spiritual answer to our problems. Does that make sense? It's, Jesus is the answer. I keep saying it. It's that simple. But that, friends, is, requires a step of faith for us. Because I don't know about you, but when I've got a crisis in front of me, I want to do something. If, if, if I've got a financial crisis on my hands, I want to, do, I want to, I want to figure, get it organized and figure it out and, and talk to some advisors. And, and I don't, My first response is not usually to sit down and say, Lord, help, I'm in crisis right now. When, I, when, when stuff comes up from a past that I've got regrets and fears and I've got shame that, that comes up from stuff I've done in the past and I go, okay, I need, to, I need to listen to some music or maybe I need to go distract myself with a book or a film. Or, and my first response is not to say, Lord, I need to spend some time with you because actually as I draw near to you, you start to sort out all of the mess in my head, in my heart, in my soul. And so what I'm trying to say to you is that actually to prioritize the spiritual, to prioritize Jesus over all of the material stuff that we could do to get ourselves out of a crisis 
it requires a step of faith. Because we don't see the spiritual. It's like, Jesus is reigning right now, presently in heaven. I don't see it. I can't touch it. I can't go and physically see him. It requires faith. That's what Hebrews says. Faith is the assurance of things not seen. We walk by faith and not by sight in 2 Corinthians. Can I encourage you that it's worth prioritizing the spiritual things. I'm going to make time to sit down and read the scriptures. I'm going to make time to pray. I want prayer to be my first response. As a church, we've put that into our core values. We want to be a prayer-dependent church. Because we want to be about a relationship with God our Father through Jesus. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Just consider that for a minute. Every spiritual blessing. There's nothing that our Father has not given us in Christ. In Christ we have also been, in verse 4, chosen by the Father. Verse 4 begins with that phrase, even as. Does someone have something different, a different phrase there? Even as. Even as he has chosen us in him. Does someone have a different phrase in their, in their translation? Everyone else has even as. That phrase, what do you have? For he chose. For he chose. So the, that phrase there, it literally means a, 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 according to. In, in a similar, it's, there's a link with the previous verse, with the fact that God gave us every spiritual blessing, even as He chose us. There's a connection, and the connection, if you look and compare the two verses, the, compa- the, the connection is that even as God blessed us in Christ, He has also chosen us in Christ. The common denominator, again, is that we have been chosen in Christ. This idea of being chosen is sometimes referred to as election by theologians. We've been chosen when? Before the foundation of the world. Before any of this existed, when, back when it was just God and the Spirit and the Son, before the foundation of the world, He chose us. This idea of being chosen is not new to Scripture, to the New Testament. In fact, if you go back to Isaiah and chapter 41 and verses 8 and 9, we're not going to jump there now, but it, it, uh, Israel was God's chosen possession. That's from Exodus chapter 19 when they're at Sinai, just before He gives them the Ten Commandments. And God says, if you follow me, if you obey my commandments, you will be for me a treasured people among the nations. The chosen. And that's what the prophet Isaiah reiterates in chapter 41. But in the following chapter, Isaiah chapter 42, God says, Behold my servant, my chosen one. And he switches, and now he's talking about Jesus, the servant. The Messiah is also chosen. So Israel is chosen. Jesus, the servant, was God's chosen one. And God says that in Luke chapter 3. No, that's beloved. Luke chapter 9, at the transfiguration, when uh, is it Elijah and Moses come down and Jesus meets with them and God says, Behold my chosen one, my son. Listen to him. Jesus is chosen. But here we see that the church is chosen as well. And I just want to, I just want to help us understand what that means. I want to suggest to you that we are chosen because Christ is chosen and we're in Christ. Therefore, we're chosen as well. Does that make sense? Are you following me there? Christ is chosen and because we're in Christ, we are chosen as well. We have that special status as well. When my first one, when Tice was born, my eldest son, we lived in the States and my parents still lived, mom and dad, lived here in the UK. And my mom flew over to be there for the birth of my son. Now, I I don't know if you've noticed, but parents don't typically fly overseas for the birth of a child that isn't their grandchild. Yeah? Darren gets married and has a kid. My parents aren't going to fly to wherever he is to witness the birth of his child. Why? Because... That's not their grandson. In a sense, what what I'm saying is that Tice benefited from the love of my parents, even though they didn't know him. They loved him the minute he was born, even before, because he was mine. 
He belonged to me. And they started to love him for himself as time went on as well. And that's the same here. We benefited from God's love. Jesus is called the beloved in verse 6. He is the beloved. His status is defined by the Father who loves him. And we benefit from that love because we are in Christ. We belong to him. We've been transferred to his kingdom. We've been chosen before the foundation of the world. Before you could do anything or try to do anything, not that you can, to earn it. Before your parents could do anything to earn it. Before anyone in the entire human race could do anything, God chose us in Christ. You'll notice that uh, this choosing, this election has a goal in verse 4. He chose us in Christ that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Election always has that goal. In the Old Testament, God put it this way. He said, I want, in Exodus chapter 19, He said, I want to Israel, I want you to be a, my treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, holy and blameless. Priests can appear before God. And Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 picks up that language about the ecclesia, the church. And he says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You've been chosen in order to be holy and blameless. Paul puts it this way. If we turn to me with Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, Paul puts it this way in Romans. 8 and verse 29. Starting in verse 28. We know this verse. And we know that for those who love God, all things work for the, together for good. For those who are called... That's that word chosen, called, elected, called according to his purpose. And then verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, those whom he chose in advance, he also predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. Can I suggest to you that that's what that, in Ephesians chapter 1, that's what that language of holy and blameless means. We were chosen in advance, before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless, to become like Jesus. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 ties it together for us. Chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. Peter writes at the beginning of his epistle and says, to those who are elect exiles, there's that chosen, elect. To those who are elect exiles, in verse 2, according, you've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and for sprinkling with Jesus' blood. You've been chosen for obedience and for sprinkling with His blood to be holy and blameless. To be holy and blameless. This is one of our core values as well as a church. We want to be transformed into the image of Jesus. That doesn't mean like that we become perfect in this life, but we want to be on that journey of becoming more Christ-like. That's the goal of the Christian life to become like Jesus and to see other people called and to become like Him as well. It's one of our core values as a church. That's what we want to be about. We want to be chasing hard after Jesus. What you worship is what you become like. We worship Him so that we can become more like Him, look more like Him. And I, I suspect that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 12, he says, offer up your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. There's that phrase again, slightly different but similar. Holy and blameless, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. We're chosen by the Father in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. 
if you're not a, 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 a Jesus follower, maybe even if you are, you think, that sounds kind of boring and holy and blameless. That sounds uh, a bit straight-laced, a bit like, come on, we want to live a little. Can I suggest to you actually that as human beings, we were designed to be in that kind of a relationship with God. And there actually is no distinction between the good life and the holy life. The, the good life is the holy life. When we start to live as Christians, as little Jesuses, we try to live like Jesus. Actually, we find that we are fulfilled. We have safety and security. Our future is, is safe. We have joy. We have purpose. All of those things that the world around us is desperately searching for. Perhaps that's you this morning as well. You're searching for those things. And to be completely honest, Jesus is the only place you're absolutely ultimately going to find that any of them, and all of them. And so the challenge for me of that, of, of this verse, chosen by the Father, is not just to be chosen in status, but to give yourself wholly to Him. Like Paul says in Romans 12, offer yourself as living sacrifices. When was the last time when you were praying and you said to Jesus, Lord, I'm all yours. Can I be really honest? That happens for me when I'm in crisis, when there's something going on and I, 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 I can't think my way out of it. I can't talk my way out of it. It's not, and I, I, God brings me to the end of myself. I say, Lord, I know you know best. Take all of me. Do what you want to do. Mold me. Shape me. When was the last time you prayed that prayer? Mold me. Shape me. I'm all yours. We're blessed in Christ. The Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He's chosen us. And lastly, He preordains or He predestines us. Oh, that, that word has some controversy. You study theology a little bit. That word gets some theology about it. But I think that's one of the words that is meant to make us stand there and go, I, I can't get my head around it. I, it's, so, it's so big. It's so incredible. He preordained, He predestined us. Before we were born, before He made the world, He decided that we would be in Christ. Oh, I, I, can you get your head around it? Have you ever thought there? I used to do this as a kid. I remember sitting there as a child and trying to get my mind around eternity. It, 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 you just to go, I, I can't do it. I can't, there's no, I have to sit here and marvel. He, he preordained us. For adoption, it says, as sons. But there's a little phrase that, that, that occurs before that. Paul says, in love, he predestined us. In love, he acted first. There's no other religion out there today where the, the, the deity, the God of that religion, whether it be Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism or the God of secularism, we talked about that a few sheep, remember the acrostic from a couple of weeks ago? There's no other God out there that acts first in love. In fact, actually, in every other religion, it's humans who have to act first to try and get the God to be good to them, to try and not be enslaved in the process of, of, of karma and, and of rebirth if you're a Hindu or a Buddhist, to, to try and, and, and earn enough points with God if you're a Muslim, with Allah. No other God... It acts, is motivated in love before we even existed. It's a love that's so immense, and you know this verse that a couple chapters later, again, Paul finds himself praying for the believers that we can grasp it. In chapter 3 and verse 17, sorry, verse 18, he, he prays, may you have the strength to comprehend with, re, comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It's a love that is so immense that Paul finds himself praying for us that we can simply grasp it in some small way. And then he uses that word predestined or foreordained. 
which is one of those marvelous things to reflect on because you go, how, how, how? because what we find, and, and if you've followed any, any, if you've ever looked into any of the theological debates, the debate is this, if God preordained us, if he decided beforehand that we were going to be in Christ, did I actually choose, did my choosing mean anything? And I want to suggest to you very simply, we won't get into it, but actually it's both. Somehow, and this is the mystery, this is the part that I just love to reflect on and go, God, you're so marvelous. How did you do that? because I don't understand. I suspect one day we'll be in heaven and we'll understand it and we'll go, we just want to worship because the, the, mar, the, the, the mystery of it, the marvelousness, the majesty of it will drive us to worship. But somehow both are true. God predestined us. He preordained us. He did it in advance and yet we still choose Him. Paul has a marvelous phrase in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 9. He says, He's talking to the Christians and he said, now that you know God, and then he pauses and says, or rather that are, you are known by God. Now that you know God, or rather that now that you are known by God. He, he, both are true, but the emphasis is on the fact that we are known by God. I, I can't help but think of Elijah on, on Mount Carmel. And he's mocking the priests. They're, they know their God. They're shouting to him and crying to him, but there's no answer. We are known by God. We know that we know God at some level because it's us, it's our knowing. But to know, to be reassured of the fact that God knows us in Christ Jesus is a marvelous thing. We were preordained. We were chosen before the foundation of the world. For what? What was the goal of it? And Paul says in verse 5, for adoption to himself as sons. I, hope, I don't know if you noticed a theme in the songs we sang. Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord, we sang in the first song. In the second song, well, that was about the three-in-one God, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three-in-one. But then our third song, we are no longer slaves to fear, slaves to sin, but we are children of God. We were preordained for adoption as sons and daughters. Some, sometimes we think about adoption as this sort of rose-colored Hollywood, you know, the, the cute little baby that gets left on the doorstep and... God, we were so cute, God couldn't resist us. That's not the picture of adoption that's here. The picture of adoption is a little harder to swallow. Because if you start to look at how Paul describes our, pre, our, our state pre-Jesus in chapter 2, we were dead in the trespasses. We were sons of disobedience, enemies of God. We were sick with sin. The picture of adoption here is not the cute little baby on the doorstep in a sense. It's, it's the child that's sick that never gets adopted, no one wants. It's the child who's older, who, who's, who's violent, and, and no one wants them. And your heart wants to break and go, that's the picture of us in sin. Unwanted, sick, violent, abandoned, drove everyone away. And despite that, God knew all of that in advance. He knew that that's what he was getting. It wasn't a, I think I'm getting a wonderful child, and oh no, they turned out to be. No, God knew all of the junk in advance. And yet he still, before any of us were born, before any of the human race existed, before the mountains and the oceans were formed, he decided, together with the Spirit and the Son, he said yes. In Christ, I want them. And so John, in 1 John in chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, See what kind of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God, for that is what we are. That's why we sang that song. That's why I love that it's repetitive, even though at some point you go, it's too repetitive, but actually we need to keep telling, no, I am. We are children of God. We're not slaves to sin. We're not sla slaves to the shame. I'm spitting all over the place. Darren, keep back. 
We're not, we don't have to run and hide from God anymore. I read, I read a, a story of a young Romanian girl who was adopted here in the UK a couple of years ago. And, and she said she didn't remember any of her time in the orphanage, but what she did remember was when she first got here, she would panic for some reason about where she would get water. And her parents would find her in the garden drinking out of the hose pipe. Because she panicked. She'd been deprived. She'd been neglected in her former life. And they found her drinking from the hope because she panicked. Friends, we don't need to panic. We don't need to run back to sin, run back to all of the old things we used to trust in because we are children of God. And this is where I want to end with this morning is that so often we have the status of being adopted Sometimes we get to the level of we have the behavior. We start to act like we're adopted. We act like part of the family. But we don't have the reality of the relationship with our Father. We have the status. We're children. We belong to God's family. We get His name. We start acting. Paul says, put to death the old life in Colossians chapter 3. Put to death what is earthly in you and put on the new clothes. Stop doing these things. We get the behavior stuff down that reality of that deep relationship with our Father is missing. And so if you walk away with one thing this morning, I, I pray, I hope that it is a hunger to know Jesus, to know the Father through, this, through Jesus, His Son, to know Him more deeply, to enter in a deeper life of communion, of fellowship with Him. Because in that, again, we find that satisfaction. We find that hope. We find the security for, the day, for today, for the future. We can rest in it. Is anyone tired this morning? Tired from running? Life is hard. There's rest there as well, friends. We're going to close with this song, Good, Good Father. And the final verse says, Love so undeniable, I can hardly speak. It's so big. Paul prays that God will help us to understand it. Peace so explainable I can hardly think. As you, as you call me deeper still, deeper into relationship, deeper into love, love, love. Not the Beatles, every, all you need is love. Not that kind of love. Not the, gotta love everybody. Not that kind of love. But love that would give himself up on a cross for us. That would die in our place deeper into that love with our Heavenly Father.